So I will talk today about, about drugs. I will talk about drug addiction, about the brain. Um, I will talk about uh, the treatment that are existing and, and the new treatment that we are trying to develop. Okay. Um, but before I tell you about all that, you'll see that there is a theme, all right, Star Wars, because I am a big fan, obviously. Um, and because it really works well with, with drugs addiction, okay? When, when you take drugs, there is a bright side to it. This is the reason why people abuse drugs. But there is a dark side, and we, we're going to talk about it. So, so many moons ago, I was um, in middle school and starting thinking about what would be my future. And my teacher asked me in front of the whole class, what would you want to do in the future? And I said, I want to be a flight attendant. And she laughed. And she said, you really, you could do better. And I was really, really bummed, because I thought flight attendant was awesome. You would travel the world, speak a lot of language, stay at great hotel. That sounded really great. Right? And I was really bummed by that. Um, but at the same time, she, she kind of inspired me. Uh, and I was thinking, well, wh why don't I be a pilot? I could be a pilot, maybe. Right? And maybe I could be an astronaut and go even farther. So for a long time, I thought about being an astronaut. The problem is, between middle school and high school, um, I kind of experimented a little bit too much. Okay, I was really good in middle school. Top of my class, I didn't have to do any homework at all. And then I tried ecstasy, I tried amphetamine, I tried alcohol, I tried pot. Pot was more really my thing. All right. And then my grades went way down, way down to the point where I turned 16, 17, and we had the, the counselor coming and asking us about what we want to do in the future. And I said, I want to be an astronaut or a pilot. And this is what I got. You will never make it to college. Forget about it. Right. And I, I was really bummed again. And I, I didn't believe it at first. I was in denial. Okay. I would smoke about six to eight joints a day. Okay, I was basically stoned every single day, completely in denial. And I got very, very frustrated, okay, very, very frustrated. I didn't know what to do. Okay, I didn't know how to study. I had not done homework for years. And it was fine until, you know, the end of high school, where it got really, really hard. Um, so what I did is I had to find a solution, right? I didn't know how to do it. So I sat down next to the best dude in high school, the one who would get A plus all the time. And during the, the classes, I would just watch him. What are you doing? What's your secret trick? Right. And I realized that he would create a structure when he takes notes with a chapter, a sub-chapter, a sub-sub-chapter. And I was like, what are you doing? Why would you do that? And then I would watch him during the exam. And we would rewrite that structure that he had, you know, took notes of during the class. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, you're supposed to answer the question, not write the class. And I said, well, what if I do that? And then I asked him, where did you find that? I said, well, I just read the book that he said we should read. I said, oh, that was a book? <laughs> OK, that was that far. And so I started following what he said. Right? Actually, the very first time, I kind of cheated during the test. And I got a good grade. And I was like, oh, so if I really do what you're doing, maybe I will get good grades on my own. Right? And I worked really hard doing that. And by the end of the year, I was top of the class. Okay? And I mostly quit smoking pot. I say mostly, I have to be honest at that time. It wasn't completely. Um, done. And then I made it to college, all right? and I followed that trick. And if you had come to my, uh, um, to my studio, it wasn't a studio, it's like, you know, I was roommate with someone, and uh, if you had to come to my place when I was in college before the exams, every single wall in my room, including the kitchen, 
and the bathrooms were full of piece of paper taped to the wall from ceiling to the floor with the structure of every single class I was taking. Okay, an organized structure with chapter and subchapter and visual summaries. So it looked like a mad, mad, mad house, okay? I was very lucky, I had a very nice girlfriend and I didn't have to find a girlfriend because I already had her, right? Because otherwise you would think I was a psycho. But it really worked, it really helped me, right? getting that structure. And so I made it to, to college and then um, I had a class with someone named Michel Lemoyle. He was a professor, uh, a very knowledgeable guy, uh, and he really opened my eyes. He was teaching neuroscience, and he was telling us how the brain controls the behavior, and how the behavior can also control the brain. Right? That it's a two-way street. And I was fascinated by that. And then, so I, I made an appointment with him because I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to tell him how great I think his science is, and I wanted to tell him about what I think about it, I had a meeting with him, and this is how it ended. You know, I was hoping that he would tell me, oh, you're such a great student, come in my lab. Okay, and this is what he said. I am amazed by your intellectual blindness. <laughs> ah, okay, great start, great start. Um, but he was right, I was pretty dumb. Okay, I didn't know anything. And, you know, it actually worked on me. Because at that point, I was not in denial anymore. I didn't think I was the best thing on earth. I really thought that I was not that great and that person could teach me how to recover from my blindness. Okay. So I worked with him for many years. Um, and then I went all the way to the PhD and at the end of my PhD, when I wrote the first draft of my PhD, he read it, and this is what he told me. Your thesis is as relevant as a fly's penis. <laughs> you worked for months writing that thing, okay? It's 400 pages. And again, you get slapped in the face, okay? So you can be upset and throw it out and, you know, quit the lab, or, or you can try to reread again and try to improve it and to make it better. All right. It was very, very harsh, very tough, very competitive. You know, you, you have to beat everyone, you have to be better than everyone. But it was really inspiring. Okay, you opened my eyes. And at that point, I had my doctorate. I thought I succeeded, that I had it all, and then I was, um, unemployed for a year. I couldn't find a job. And I was lucky enough to have someone here at Scripps who offered me a job as a postdoctoral fellow, okay? By the way, he said last year, he told my mentor actually that I was actually his best student. <laughs> 20 years later, okay? <laughs> so, you know, I really love that man. Um, so this is my uh, former mentor, George Kub who was at Scripps Research Institute, and he taught me something else. He told me kindness, okay? Whenever my previous mentor told me to be, taught me to be tough, to be harsh, to be competitive, and this one told me, you know, when you're upset, when you don't like someone, kill them with kindness, and you'll see that it will disarm them, and you'll get better, because in science, you need to collaborate with people, okay? And this is, a really, really important message if you want to succeed in the future, you need to collaborate with people. You need to study, you need to have study group, okay? Get the best guy in your school, get the lowest guy in your school, put them together and they, they both succeed. So let's talk about drugs. Okay, I'm going to talk about drugs, I'm going to talk about addiction, I'm going to talk about how it affects your brain and how we can fix it. So why do we do drugs? Obviously, we don't do drugs to end up like that, right? That's not the original goal. <laughs> Nobody wants to become like that, right? And what are drugs? Sure, meth is a drug. All those are drugs, you know that. But what about wine? Wine is, wine is a drug. 
I consider that a drug. What about nicotine? What about tobacco? What about vaping? All those are drugs, right? Whenever I say drugs, today I mention those two. What about coffee? Coffee is a drug, okay? There is caffeine in it. It is the most used psychostimulant on Earth, okay? It's the most consumed drug on Earth. So this is a drug. What about those? Those are fun. Uh, you see? You know what I'm talking about. This is a drug, okay? Those are macaron, okay? Macaroon, like, say, like my wife would say. Okay, so a drug is any chemical agent that affects the organism. And sometimes we talk about psychotropic drugs. Psychotropic drugs are any chemical that affects your mind and your behavior. So this is what we are talking about. That includes caffeine, that includes macaroons, okay? So some of those drugs can be medicine. Uh, you probably recognize all those drugs, methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, right? Most of those are bad chemicals, right? Are there any medicine among those? Yes, there are some. But some of those can be really deadly, all right? Every year in the US, we have about half a million people dying from the consequences of tobacco. Half a million, okay? 88,000 people from alcohol, 50,000 people from opioid, okay? You notice here, some of those are pretty safe, okay? THC, CBD, ecstasy, LSD, um, those are pretty safe. They have very, very low amount of death, but some of them have really bad consequences. That's the dark side of drugs. The bright side of drugs is all those drugs have potential uh, medicinal properties. Everything that is in red here are actually approved treatment for a medical condition. Yes, you can prescribe methamphetamine to kids, and it is done for the treatment of ADHD or ob obesity. Yes, cocaine can be used for the treatment of local, as a local anesthetic. Okay. A lot of people do not know that. THC, CBD, actually LSD should be in orange, by the way. There is a mistake here. But a lot of those drugs are potential medicines, okay? And there is a lot of hope that um, some of those drugs will be able to help people with PTSD, anxiety, and depression soon. So it's all about how you take it, okay? There are ways to take drugs that is safe. There are ways to take drugs that are safe, and there are ways to take drugs that are not safe at all. Uh, and this is a difference between a medication and a drug of abuse. So why do people do drugs? Why do you guys take drugs? Because I know you do. You don't tell anybody, you don't tell your parents, you don't tell your teacher. But I know there is uh, probably about a 20, 30% of you guys who have tried most of the previous drugs. So why do you take them? Well, there is so many reasons why you would take them. You're curious, you're experimenting. Okay? You're seeking a euphoria, you're seeking a pleasure. You want to get high. You don't even know why you want to get high, but you want to get high. You want to experience that, that phenomenon. You want, you want, you're seeking that loss of consciousness getting out of this world. Okay. You are rebellious, you are seeking risk. People are like that. You, you're teenagers, this is what teenagers do. Okay. And then there are, so those are the, you know, the kind of the, kind of the bright side of drugs, they kind of interesting. And then there is a bad side, right? You have the pain, the sadness, the anxiety, the depression, the self-medication. So there are two sides of, um, of drug use. The first one is the bright side. Okay. So it's the pleasure, the euphoria. All that contributes to drug use, it's called positive reinforcement. You're seeking the high, you're seeking the pleasure. It's great, it makes your behavior increase. You want more of it. And then you have the dark side, the pain the anxiety, the stress, the cognitive impairment, the insomnia, the craving. And the problem in drug addiction and drug use is not really the bright side, it's the dark side. Because the dark side will last for months and for years. Okay. 
So how do you move from the bright side to the dark side? That's the big question that we're trying to answer. Why are some people able to stay in the bright side for months, years, try it a few times and be done with it, while others will go into the dark side and not being able to get out of it? So that's what we are trying to answer. So what is addiction? Can you be addicted to Star Wars? And this is the problem. No, you cannot be addicted to Star Wars. No, you cannot be addicted to books. An addiction is not just a fun term that we throw out like that, okay? There is a very specific condition that is term addiction. You know, an equivalent thing would be, well, you cannot see very well when it's, uh, you're nearsighted or farsighted and you say, I'm blind. No, you're not blind. You're nearsighted or farsighted, okay? Let's say you have arthritis and you have problems moving around, you know, and you move very slowly. Are you saying that you have Parkinson's? No, you say you have arthritis. And the problem with addiction is that people think that you can be addicted to anything. And therefore, if you can be addicted to anything, then it is a choice, it is a lifestyle. No, it is not, and I will show you that, okay? Addiction is a very specific condition. It is not just doing a lot of something. Yes, you have a hobby, you love books, you love Star Wars, you can't wait to watch it 25 times, but you never lost your job, you didn't lose your wife, you didn't lose your kids, you didn't lose your liver from it, right? So there is a difference. So what is addiction? Well, back in the early 20th centuries, drugs were really nice. Right? You could go to the store and get some cocaine toothpick drops for your kids. Get some little cocaine on your teeth, you know, so that you numb the pain. Right? Or you could get um, wine here with cocaine too. You could get heroin easily on store. My favorite one is this one, one night cough syrup. It has alcohol, cannabis, chloroform, and morphine. <laughs> okay. Very well named, one night. <laughs> Might not even make it through the night, okay? <clears throat> and the problem were the addicts, okay? They were bad people. They had a curse. They were sinners. The problem were not the drugs. They were the addicts. They had to be punished, okay? You had to put them in jail, okay? Those were, those two were what, 100 years ago, right? Hopefully we're not there. We're not here yet, like it's not happening anymore. People do not think like that anymore, right? Or maybe they do, okay? This is your former attorney general. Okay, good people don't smoke marijuana. That's a problem. Some people still hold the same thoughts and opinions that we had 100 years ago. So what do kids think? I asked my, I have a 10 year old and I ask him what is addiction, you know, what are drugs? And this is what it looks like. It's like, eh, kind of fun, life of the party. Okay. And we think those thoughts are, you know, v v minor, they don't really matter as what those kids think. It does matter, okay? If uh, a kid has a biased vision of drugs and alcohol, where they only see the positive side, they are much more likely to start drinking early at 13, 14, 15 year old, right? Um, the kids that have only positive views of drugs and alcohol, they have an early drinking. The opposite is true too. If you tell the kids, drugs are bad, alcohol is bad, there is nothing good about it, they also start early because they realize you lied to them, okay? If you tell them that we'll all die after taking a few drugs that you're gonna hook on, on, on cocaine right away the first time you try it, they all have a friend that who try that and who leave to say, well, they are lying to you. Right? And then you don't believe anything you were told and you're gonna go the other side, on the dark side too. Right? So what, what works is a balanced view. Why is it important? Because if you drink early, you are more likely to become addicted. Okay? If you start, Drinking when you're 13 year old, this is not even drinking regularly. It's your first binge. 
then you are three times more likely to become an alcoholic. My first binge was when I was 12 years old. And I had repeated binges after that, thanks to my older brothers. Right, we were partying in the house. And guess what? I had some issue with alcohol. Right. It makes it much harder because your brain is not finished yet. Okay, it's still developing. What do your teachers think? Right. Tell you to stay away from drugs and tell you to take your, your Ritalin, your ADHD medication. And a lot of people are afraid of that. They say, well, you know, it's very hypocritical and then we over-medicate our kids and they're gonna become drug addicts later because they take those medication. Guess what? It's not true. If you have ADHD and you are unmedicated, you have one chance out of three to become an addict. If you are medicated, you have the same risk than someone who doesn't have ADHD. Okay? And this is the big difference between drugs and medicine. Okay? It might be the same compound, the same molecule, the exact same molecule. In one case, it will make you an addict, it will destroy your life. In another case, it will make you successful and healthy. The difference comes down to the pharmacokinetic, the way it works on your brain. There is a difference between snorting a line of cocaine and taking a pill that will take 12 hours to have their effect. Okay? It, there is no dark magic behind that. There is a lot of science that explains why when you take drugs very quickly, like when you snort it or when you smoke it, it affects your brain differently than when you swallow a pill. Okay? and when it's prescribed at a correct dosage. What does the Drug Enforcement Agency think? Well, the DEA, you might have seen the movie, Nar the TV show Narcos on Netflix. Well, the DEA thinks that drugs is about money and about um, guns, about violence, and all we should do is put those people in jail. And this is what we have been doing since the 1970s. Okay. You have here the beginning of the war on drugs. The war on drugs was a great idea in theory. Right. And all we have been doing for the last 50 years is putting these people in jail and learning more about how to better deal drugs. Because this is where you learn how to be a real criminal, it's in jail. All right, so we've been incarcerating massive amount of people, young adults, for sometimes minor crimes of just dealing cannabis. Those people are in jail, and now you end up in California where you realize that you have people making millions and millions of dollars legally selling it, while you have kids that are still in jail for the same thing that they did a few years ago. Okay, and that didn't work. Are we having less addiction now than before? No, I'll show you we have 10 times more people addicted to drugs. So that approach failed. What does the press think? Well, every time we hear about drugs and addiction, you hear about dopamine. Dopamine is the holy grail that explains in addiction, and people are seeking dopamine. Well, that's just, uh, don't believe that, okay? This is just a sh a shortcut used by journalists because they don't um, understand what is happening at the neurobiological level. But dopamine has very little effect on drug addiction, okay? It is one of the reasons why you might take drugs at first, but that has nothing to do with drug addiction. Not nothing, but very little to do with drug addiction. So and I'll show you um, some data related to that. So what does the number say? Well, the numbers say that we are at a critical level in drug addiction. We have an epidemic of overdose in this country. You see those two maps separated by 15 years. You realize that for some reason that people do not understand very well, we are dying at alarming rates. We have to do something about it. For the first time in the history of the United States, the the mortality is increasing in Americans, okay? In all the countries 
the mortality is decreasing because you have better health care, because people take better care of themselves. What's happening in the US? You die younger and younger. Why? Because of poisoning. Poisoning means overdose. Most of the poisoning is actually the, the term used by the CDC, the governmental agency, agency to, uh, to explain overdoses. Okay. And you have that dramatic increase in overdose. So in the US right now, you have about 535,000 people dying every year from drug addiction. This is more than the Civil War I, more than the World War I and World War II. Okay, the Civil War and the World Wars. Every day, if you take the casualty that they had every day, you have more than that. What are we doing? How many trillions of dollars are we spending to try to fight that? Nothing. The budget for drug addiction in the US is what? A, million, a, a billion and a half. That's four days of war in Afghanistan, okay? And we have half a million people dying. So we need to do something about it. And this has been exponential. If you think that a governmental measure that is happening now is gonna fix the problem next year, it's not happening. This is exponential. It will be worse next year. It will take decades to fix that. Um, and so we have a mission to do it. So what is addiction? Well, to understand what is addiction, you have to go back to the definition. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the word addict. That meant to devote, to surrender, and to assign. When gladiators were exceptional, when they were winning, they were given an addict, which was a slave. Okay, so being an addict is being a slave to someone, being a slave to something. It is not seeking a reward, seeking a pleasure. It is not euphoria. It is very dark, okay? When you hear about drug addiction being a reward seeking, it is not the definition of an addict. Edgar Allan Poe said, I have absolutely no pleasure in the stimulants in which I sometimes so madly indulge. It has not been in the pursuit of pleasure that I have period life and reputation and reason. It has been the desperate attempt to escape from torturing memories, from a sense of insupportable loneliness and the dread of some strange impending doom. Where's the pleasure here? There is no pleasure. This is what addiction is about. Do you feel like that when you are binging on Star Wars and you say you're addicted? No, you don't. Okay, there is a difference. Ricky Williams Jr. was an NFL player. He would say when people talk about drugs, they assume people take drugs because they enjoy it. But really, it's no different from overeating or watching too much television or drinking too much. You take drugs to make yourself feel better, to feel a whole. That's the key. You make yourself to feel better, to feel a whole. And we're going to talk about that whole. Okay. He had severe alcoholism. So what is addiction? If you talk to a clinician, there is a definition of addiction, okay? There are 11 criteria that you need to fulfill. So now you can self-diagnose yourself today and self-diagnose your parents and your sibling if you want. Addiction is about binging. Do you binge? Large amounts and fast. Have you failed to quit? Have you tried to quit and failed to quit? Or have you been thinking of quitting but never done it? Do you spend a lot of time doing it during the day or seeking the drug or taking the drug? Are you craving the drug? Do you have time when there are moments in the day where you cannot think about anything else but the drug? You're trying to think about something else, but you cannot think about anything else. Are you failing school, work, or your home duties? Do you have interpersonal issues your family, with your coworkers? Are you losing some of your activities? Did you give up on you know, going to the theater, or going to the beach, playing soccer or softball, just to do drugs instead? Are you having a hazardous use? You know, are you drinking and driving? Are you doing beer bong on top of a roof? You know? Are you smoking pot next to a police station? All right. Do you have adverse consequences? Do you have health issues associated with it? Okay, have you lost your job? Have you had a divorce because of that? Have you ended up at the ER because of that? 
Are you tolerant? So have you increased your dose progressively because that small dose that you had before is just not enough? At first, a couple of beer was enough, but now you need, you know, six shots. Do you have withdrawal? All right, when you quit the drug, do you feel anxious, stress, a little shaky, irritable, irritable? You get cranky? Those are, are withdrawal. And so you score these, these symptoms, 1.4 each. If you have 0 or 1, you're fine, okay? Go home. <laughs> if you have 2 or 3, it's called a mild substance use disorder. If you have four or five, it's called a moderate substance use disorder. And if you have more than six, this is called severe use disorder. And this is what addiction is. It's more than six. It is not just two, three, four, five. This is just abusing drugs. You're at risk. Maybe you become an addict later, but you're not addicted yet. So you see that being addicted is having a lot more symptoms than what you think. And when you get to all those symptoms, you really have a different brain. Okay? Your brain is not the same anymore. This is why it's called a brain disorder. So when you're in the, in the first category, zero, one, two, three, maybe there is a choice involved here. Maybe you have the choice of quitting. Okay, so maybe you, behavioral therapy can work very well at that stage. When you get past six, it is not much of a choice anymore. It is survival. Okay, because when you get to that point, your brain needs the drug. So the drug uh, addiction is a chronic, relapsing brain disorder, okay, associated with compulsive use and driven by negative emotional state. Those are the key words, okay? And there are different types of addiction depending on the drug and depending on the individual. So how do they affect the brain? Well, there are way too many targets to talk about it right now. It depends on the drug. It will depend on the individual, depending on the genetic makeup. You see that all those drugs have different targets in the brain. So you can see how you might have different disorder at the end. You might have different type of addiction, different type of medication and treatment that may work. And so how does it affect the brain? It's important to understand that there are three pillars in addiction that makes an addict. Habit, incentive salience, and hedonic allostasis. So habit, you know what habit is. Right? You pick up a good habit or a bad habit. And we know that this is due to activation of a brain region called the striatum. This brain region gets hyperactivated when you take drugs. This is an, an example when you take uh, morphine. It will be the same with heroin. What you see right here are all those subcortical regions, including the striatum, that are activated when you take drugs. Okay? All those red curves here going up, uh, the striatum being activated. So those, this brain region, is the same brain region that will make you uh, really good at you know, riding a bicycle or playing piano really quickly. It's really good to form habits. So this is one of the pillars. Okay. The second one is uh, hedonic allostasis. It's the idea that when you take drugs at first, you get really high and your brain will bring you down to kind of normalize the activity of your brain. If you have ever tried to jump out of an airplane, I have done it. It is the biggest euphoria you will ever have. It's very scary, but you have a great euphoria, and then you are drained for three hours afterward. Why? Because the brain normalizes your brain function to make you back to normal, right? So there is a homeostasis normally. With allostasis, what, what is happening is your brain will make you low, low, low to anticipate the future drug intake. And this is why you become stressed, anxious, depressed, chronically, and the only way to go back to normal is to take the drug. And we know that the amygdala here, um, the amygdala here is really important for that. The amygdala and the striatum too, actually. So what you see here is the striatum 
in different uh, drug user, and you see it's not the same pattern. You have a lot less red. Why do you have a lot less red? Because you have less dopamine. It shows you that a drug addict doesn't have more dopamine than anybody else. It has less dopamine. It is that allostasis, that feel bad feeling. You are stressed, you're anxious, you are anhedonic, you don't have any pleasure in life. You have not enough dopamine. Okay. And you have a hyperactive amygdala. What you see here in, in, in red is how much the amygdala is influencing the rest of the brain. Your brain has changed, the amygdala controls most of the brain, and the amygdala is activated when you are stressed, when you are fearful, when you are anxious. Okay. And the last part is incentive salience. Incentive salience is how you get attracted to things. Okay, a drug addict get really attracted to paraphernalia, to cues and context associate, associated with the drug. It's like acting like a magnet. Right. And the reason for that, for that is because the cortexes, the cortices here, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, part of the amygdala, whenever they will see a cue that, or a context associated with the drug, they will produce a very, very strong craving. Okay. And you can see that using brain imaging where you have patients here that are in the scanner and they show pictures of paraphernalia and they are drug addict. And you see the cortex being activated and this is highly correlated with, with craving, with wanting to take the drugs. So you have those three phenomena happening at the same time. You have the habit forming, you have the withdrawal, the negative affective state that produce that extreme driving force to make you want to take the drug. And then you have the cortex that get activated by those cues and contexts and tell you, go take it, go take it. Okay. There is a lot more than that. I call that the spaghetti ball. They, when you look at all the brain region involved, you realize that it is a very complicated disorder. Right? Because there are multiple disorders depending on the drugs that you are using. Some, some people will take the drug to re relieve the pain. Others will take the drug um, because of the habits. Some will take the drug because of the euphoria. And you have different brain regions dysregulated in different people. So it is very important to consider the fact that not only you have different drug addiction, but you also have people that will have different type of comorbidities. Some people will have anxiety. Some people will have depression. Okay. So you need to treat those comorbidities too. Uh, because we are all different. We are all different. Um, and there is work that is being done right now that just started a couple of years ago to try to identify those differences. Right? Some people will take the drug because of the cognitive impairment that they have when they are off the drug. Some people will take the drug because of that incentive salience. Some people will take the drug because of the pain. We are all different. Right? So it is important to try to identify what are the genes in you that make you more prone to being an addict or not. Or what are the genes in you that will make you sensitive to a medication but not another. Right? So we are trying to do that in the lab. So how do we fix it? Okay. The treatment right now do not work very well. They do not work very well at all. So we need to find better. So how do we do that? We go back to the clinical symptoms and we try to apply them to rats. Right. And we try to find behaviors that mimics those symptoms. And we can get animal to self-administer anything, almost. Cocaine, methamphetamine, alcohol, heroin. We actually have in the lab now experiments where we get rats to vape. <laughs> if you're interested, I'll show you the data. Sierra can tell you about it too. We get rats to vape alcohol and to vape nicotine. Um, and they will work for it really hard. At first, they have to press a lever, and they get one dose. 
and you can ask them to press the lever two times, four times, eight times, 16 times, up to a thousand times, and they would do it when they are becoming addicted to it. Okay, some of them will not, but some of them will. So we're interested in the difference between those two. Some of them will, res will respond, will take the drug, despite the fact that you give them a food shock. Okay, you know, like the equivalent of a back collar for a dog. You know, they work very well. I'm using that on my dog right now, it's wonderful. He's done it a couple of times, and then he's not doing it anymore. He's like, okay, I got it. I'm stopping being a brat, okay? It works, okay? Uh, some rats will keep doing it, despite the fact that they're getting shocked, just like a human will keep doing it despite the fact of getting arrested or ended up at the hospital, okay? And some will show withdrawal. Rats will show pain, they will show irritability. They will show anxiety-like behavior. So we can model that in, in animals. And what you see is you have, this is a big cohort of 250 animals, and you have animals that are resistant to the drug. They don't care at all. They try cocaine a couple of times, and they're like, whatever. They don't take it anymore. And some are taking a huge amount of cocaine. They will keep pressing despite the fact that you give them a food shock, despite the fact that you ask them to press a thousand times. If they don't care, they need their fix. Okay, so what is the difference between those rats? Okay, what are the, the genes that make you a vulnerable individual or um, a severe user? So we are doing genetic testing right now to try to find those gene variants that may predict who can become addicted or not and who will be receptive to some drugs while others will not. Okay, and trying to find biomarkers too. What we are trying to do also is develop small molecules, small molecules that can cross your blood-brain barrier, reach your brain, and inactivate receptors or activate receptors that were dysfunctional before. So here's an example. Um, it is a, a dopaminergic antagonist that focuses on a receptor that we have not been able to target before because it was too close from, a different, from another receptor. Now we have a specific drug that captures only that receptor, inactivate only that receptor, and we have great success decreasing oxycodone intake in both male and female. Right. So they, ha they have been testing this, this compound um, at NIDA, National Institute on Drug of Abuse. They've done that in monkeys too, it works. And they're hoping that and they'll be able to test that in humans soon. So there are small molecules, and we have a couple of dozen of molecules that we are testing right now, some of them that are very promising, and um, the first one should be able to be tested in humans next year. Okay. What we're looking at also are orphan receptors. This is an orphan receptor. What is an orphan receptor? Well, just like the name is, means it doesn't have a daddy or a mommy yet. Okay, it doesn't even have a name. Okay, it's a number. We don't know what is activating that receptor. We don't know its function. We know what it looks like, but we have no idea what it does in the brain. Okay. And so they are amazing target for therapeutic development because everything has to be done and maybe it is the key that has never been studied yet, okay? So we have, I cannot really see the graph here, but we have identified an orphan receptor in a small brain region that gets activated during withdrawal, okay? When you take drugs, you're going through withdrawal, that brain region gets incredibly activated. And we believe that it produces that motivation to take the drug again because you feel terrible. And if you activate that orphan receptor, the animal, all of a sudden, they don't feel the pain during withdrawal, and they drink less alcohol. Okay. So we're very excited about um, targeting this receptor, and the goal is now to do some high throughput screening where we're gonna test hundreds of thousands of molecules in a little petri dish to try to find new compound that could be used for the treatment of drug addiction um, using this target. Another approach is called an enzymatic approach. Here, 
what you're trying to do is prevent the drug from reaching the brain. Okay. So there is this bacteria that lives on tobacco leaves in China. And that bacteria uses nicotine as a source of energy, just like you use cupcakes. Okay? They use nicotine. And if you, if you take that bacteria, you can isolate the enzyme that degrades nicotine. And if you take that enzyme and give, give it to, uh, to rats that are self-administering self nicotine, you can decrease the level of nicotine in the blood to a point that it doesn't even have time to reach the brain, or almost all of it. 98% okay? of the nicotine is degraded before it reaches the brain, and only a couple of percent are reaching the brain. What does it do? Well, when you're going through it all, you have a lot of pain, physical pain, and we, have, we can measure that in, in, in rodents. You see that decrease here is called pain threshold, is how much of a stimulation do you need to produce pain during withdrawal, you're really in pain. If you give that enzyme, you don't have the pain anymore during withdrawal. Okay. During withdrawal, that's what you see in, in blue, you are also um, very aggressive. And actually the colors, I think, are switched here. No, during withdrawal, you are very aggressive, defensive, you are very irritable. If you give that enzyme, the animals do not feel aggressive or defensive anymore. They are not irritable anymore. Because you let them, you give them time to become less dependent and less dependent. Okay? Because the nicotine is not activating the nicotine receptor. Right? But it leaves just a little bit of nicotine, just enough to pro provide a relief from the withdrawal. So it's a little bit paradoxical. Um, at first, we thought that that enzyme was a little bit leaky. It was a, a problem because there would be a still a little bit of nicotine reaching your brain. It's not a problem, it's actually the solution. And we have seen that in smokers. If you give a smoker a denicotinized nicotine that has very low level of nicotine, they find that very relieving. They're like, okay, finally I have a cigarette. It might be the worst cigarette I've ever had, but I'm not through withdrawal anymore. So this is the equivalent. You would take that pill, and even if you relapse, even if you go to 7-Eleven and get a cigarette, you wouldn't feel the euphoric effect of nicotine. You would just feel the relief from withdrawal, and you wouldn't have the motivation to continue taking that cigarette because it doesn't taste that great. Okay. And we've tested that in animal models. If you give them a food shock without the enzyme, they don't care about it. They actually take even more nicotine. If they have the enzyme on board, they are taking a lot less nicotine because it's not that great. It's the worst cigarette you've ever had. And if you try to make them relapse two weeks later using a stress or by giving them a high dose of nicotine, if you had the enzyme, you do not relapse here. You see, when you go up, you relapse if with the enzyme, you don't relapse at all, okay? So it gives your body time to become less dependent on nicotine and prevent relapse and make those cigarettes less attractive. So we are very excited about uh, that potential new therapeutic. Another thing that we can do is whole brain imaging. Um, scientists have been focused on small brain regions because we didn't have the technique to image the whole brain at a time. Now we do. What you see here is a brain under the effect of cocaine. Every flickering dot that you see is a brain that is activated by cocaine. This is your whole, the whole brain of a rat going from top to bottom. Okay. We can image about, in this picture, you have about 150,000 neurons activated at the same time. Right. And we see the whole brain, something we've never been able to do before. So we can find new targets. We can finally understand why drugs make us so high, so hallucinating on, on psychedelics. Why does it make us so euphoric on opioids? What are the brain regions controlling that? Okay. Is it just a couple of brain regions, or is it the whole brain? Well, we have the answer to that there is about 0.1% of the brain that is activated. 
it's a very, very small number of neurons that are activated, 0.1%. That's it. But those 0.1% can control the rest of the brain. Okay. You have here a normal brain. All these are brain regions. When you have red, it means those two brain regions are talking to each other in a coordinated manner. And you have major brain regions, set of brain regions that are coordinated with each other, right? The somatosensory cortex works with a bunch of brain regions to make sure that I don't fall on stage, right? So you have those coordinated brain regions. My auditory cortex and visual cortex will be communicating with each other. So you have an organization. If you look at the cocaine brain, this is what it looks like. A Scottish kilt. Okay? Your whole brain is disorganized. It does not function like normal. You actually need to re-scramble, to reorganize all those brain regions to find some coordination. So your whole brain is working in a different mode. Okay, so this 0.1% of neuron activated by the drug will have a massive effect on how your brain function. And this time of brain, where you go down from a bunch of different macrostructure organized together to two, three different macrostructure, you see that in which condition? Alzheimer's disease, traumatic brain injuries. Okay, so those effects are major. But the hope is we can use this approach to target new brain region. And we can target new brain region using brain stimulation like we do in Parkinson's disease. You have an example here, what we do in the lab where we implant an electrode in the right brain, this is a human, but in the right brain, and whenever we stimulate that electrode, it will paradoxically inhibit a brain region that is overactive during withdrawal. And you, what you see here is animals that are taking um, heroin in white with a control, and when you stimulate that brain region, they take a lot less nicotine, a uh, lot less heroin. So you can control the brain region using this brain stimulation. And you can even go farther using optogenetics where you can use a laser. You can use a laser to target neurons very specifically. Okay, what you see here uh, uh, in greens, neuron that expresses a peptide, a stress peptide called corticotropin releasing factor. This peptide is activated during stress. It is activated during drug withdrawal. And now we can stimulate only this small population of neurons or we can inhibit them. So they're activated by stress. So that what did we do? We use a laser to turn off those neurons. Okay, you see them, you can turn them off using a switch. And when you do that, you have here alcohol drinking in animals that are dependent on alcohol. When the switch is off, they're drinking a lot of alcohol. When you turn the switch on, they stop drinking. Turn it off, they drink again. Turn it on, they stop drinking. Okay, it is really remarkable. You can control the behavior, you can control the thought of this animal just with the light switch. So it will take some time to develop that for human, but there, is, there are clinical trials right now that are beginning uh, to, to use that technology for the treatment of blindness and the treatment of pain in the spine. If those work, the next step would be to go deep in the brain. All right, so, Drugs are fascinating, but dangerous, so be careful. I know that some of you will experiment or have been experimenting. Be careful, they can be very dangerous. But at the same time, you don't want to make them the enemy because those drugs have very high potential as medicine if they are taken carefully under the prescription, under um, a physician prescription, okay? So you don't want to make them your enemy. You need to be able to uh, study them and use them at your advantage. Addiction is a chronic brain disorder with compulsive use and negative emotional states. Drugs will change the brain. Sometimes it will be reversible. It will go away in a few weeks, a couple of months. Sometimes it will be permanent, like with alcohol or methamphetamine. Those 
drugs will create long-lasting changes that will last for years. Um, education, harm reduction policy combined with effective treatments is the solution. Okay. And so we are working hard to try to develop new therapeutic approaches um, that could potentially in 5, 10, 20, 30 years uh, revolutionize the treatment. That is our hope. Um, I'd like to um, thank you for your attention, and I'd like to thank my entire, my, my entire lab, including Sierra Simpson and uh, Kokila Shankar, who's in the audience. I'd like to thank uh, my funding sources, the National Institute of Health, um, who's supporting all this work, as well as uh, the state of California, who is helping us developing a new animal model for uh, electronic cigarette use. And I would like to thank the, the Pearson Center here at Scripps for uh, supporting us in, our, in this endeavor. And I thank you for your attention again.